Good afternoon. I'm Lillian Lodge Copenhaver, Dean Emeritus and Professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Florida International University. I am pleased to welcome you this afternoon to the fourth presentation of our leadership webinar series of the Lillian Lodge Copenhaver Center for the Advancement of Women in Communication. The mission of our center is to empower young women, both academics and professionals, to become visionaries and leaders in the fields of mass communication and to make a difference in their communities and in their professions. I would also like to have you visit our research forum, which is becoming the go-to place for studies on women in communication. Throughout the year, we have lots of other projects, exciting activities planned, all of which are designed to provide opportunities for young women to develop leadership potential in the field of communication. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. And please visit us at copenhavercenter.org and let us hear from you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Marielena Villar, who will be our host for this afternoon's webinar. Marielena. Hi, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us, those of you that are here and those that are joining us online. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our guest today, um, Dr. Bailing Shaw. She is a professor and interim director in the School of Journalism and Media Studies at San Diego State University. Um, she is an award-winning researcher. Her research areas include the intersection of identity and public relations, as well as international public relations, activism, and gender. And she has been widely published and um, received a, uh, various awards for her research. Um, in 2012, she was honored by the Public Relations Society of America as an Outstanding Educator of the Year and has also received many other teaching um, recognitions. Um, before becoming a full-time educator, Dr. Shaw was the Public Affairs Officer for the U.S. Census Bureau. So she has both the academic and the practical experience and she continues to do pro bono work in the community. Um, importantly, she is uh, the chair of the 2014 chair of the Universal Accreditation Board, which oversees the world's largest certification program in public relations. Um, she holds a PhD in mass communication from the University of Maryland, and she's accredited in public relations. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bailing Shaw. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me here. It's really my pleasure and honor to speak to the Copenhaver Center for the Advancement of Women in Communication. Um, the title of my presentation today is Finding Your Leadership Voice. And what I thought I would do is go over briefly each of the words um, in that title, Finding Your wait, finding your <laughs> leadership voice. Um, so to begin with, I would like to talk about the your in your voice, because I think before we can talk about your voice, you need to talk about yourself and to know who you are. Um, so as you've just heard, one of my research areas is identity. And when we research identity, um, we know that identity really breaks down into two facets. On the one hand, we have what researchers call avowed identity. And avowed identity is the identity that you claim for yourself. On the other hand, we have ascribed identity. And ascribed identity is the identity that other people assign to you. So, for example, um, for myself, I avow an identity as a college professor um, because I'm here invited to this prestigious venue. Um, you all probably also ascribe to me um, an identity as a college professor. Um, but you know, I'm also the grandchild of people who never had the opportunity to go to college and that's not something that's a part of my identity um, that people may not realize when they first meet me. Something else that people may not realize when they first meet me is that English is not my native language. My first language was Chinese because my parents were immigrants to this country and we were required to speak Chinese at home. I remember being totally punished when I spoke English at home. Um, so today I'm a great English speaker and that's the identity that I avow. Um, but sometimes in America, unfortunately, when you look a certain way, people ascribe to you a non-American identity, even though the identity that you avow might still be very much American. Um, 
I think that's part of the immigrant experience, is in many cases, immigrants avow an identity as an American, but it takes a while for mainstream Americans to ascribe an American identity to those immigrant communities. And that's a challenging situation to be in, um, but I would say that as immigrants and as minorities, we do have the advantage of inhabiting multiple cultures. And I would just say that we should embrace those cultures and definitely embrace all of the languages that come with those cultures because words reflect culture. And you can't truly know a culture unless you are fluent in the language of that culture. Um, so that's kind of the personal side. For the professional side, I would say that you also need to know a language to professional standards. Um, I'm ashamed to admit that even though I am trilingual, Chinese, English, and French, my Chinese is really not up to professional standards. Um, and that's kind of, you know, not, not, not great. So if there are people watching this webinar who speak more than one language, I would say that's awesome. But you know, it's just like not everybody who speaks English can be a television reporter in English. Not everybody who speaks Spanish can have a media career in Spanish and English. So you really have to um, work on those language skills and raise them to professional standards. And I know that Florida International has a great master's degree program that is for bilingual journalists, and I think that's a, that's a a wonderful um, program. So um, getting back to this idea of identity, um, everyone, even non-immigrants, we all have multiple identities, right? So I'm simultaneously a professor, a wife, a mom, um, and I think one of the challenges that we have sometimes in finding our voice is knowing which of those identities um, we're speaking on behalf of. And I think that's just kind of acknowledging that sometimes you speak um, with one voice, sometimes you speak with another voice, but they're all a part of you and they're all a part of who you are. Okay, so the second part about finding your voice um, in terms of the you is you know, the first part is knowing who you are, knowing your identity. I think the second part is what um, I would call authenticity. So authenticity has been defined as the alignment of thoughts, words, and action. So, you know, our actions have to reflect our words, and our words really ought to reflect our thoughts. So if your actions don't reflect your words, maybe you need to try harder with your actions or maybe you need to change your words. I mean, so for example, I always say um, that my children are important to me. Of course, I'm a mom. No mom says my kids are not important to me, right? So I always say my kids are important to me and last week I left work early so that I could go to a school event because my children were winning some awards. But you know, usually I don't leave work early. Usually my children go to um, an after-school program, which they don't really like. And so frequently you have these family conversations and like, why can't you pick me up early? And, and so I've been thinking about this a lot and I'm like, maybe I should stop saying my children are important to me. Maybe I should say my children are as important to me as my professional work because if only my children were important to me, I would leave work ev early every day to pick them up and that's just, now that's just not a reality. Um, so that's something that I'm personally struggling with, which as a side note, work-life balance is hard for everybody and that's <laughs> not really in the theme of my talk today, but I'm sure if people wanna ask questions, I'm happy to discuss that later. Okay, so just as actions reflect um, your words, I think words need to be reflections of our thoughts. Um, and we all have mean thoughts. And I know when I was younger, I would have mean thoughts and not say them. And I would think, oh, I'm such a good person. I'm having this mean thought, but I'm holding my tongue and not saying anything. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, does that really make me a good person? Like maybe if I'm a really good person, I just shouldn't have these mean thoughts to begin with. Um, and you know, when I do have the mean thoughts, maybe I should just say them because then I'll feel better. Um, so you know, again, this goes back to the question of authenticity and being being authentic, which is where your thoughts really are reflected in your words, and then your words are reflected in your actions. And um, that's just something I would suggest that people consider as we think about the you in your voice. So now let me talk about voice. Um, and with respect to voice, um, the your voice, voice part, 
There are three things that I think are basic to what we as leaders need to say. And those three things are yes, no, and help. So let me briefly go over each of those. Um, when you use your voice to say yes, um, you're welcoming new opportunities and experiences, anything that will kind of grow you and give you a chance to do something new, something different, something that's maybe a little bit scary, like doing a webinar when you don't really know if there's anybody out there really watching. Um, I've tried to do this um, in my own experience. I grew up in Texas and I said yes to going to college in Indiana, which um, from Texas is really far away and is a whole different world. Um, I said yes to my great position at San Diego State University when we moved out there 10 years ago. I moved my family across the country from DC to San Diego State, which was really, really scary, but it's turned out to be a fabulous career move. Um, so those are just two examples of where saying yes has been really advantageous for me. But on the flip side, um, in as much as leaders say yes, leaders sometimes also have to say no. And I would suggest that you say no when you protect yourself from negative people and potentially bad situations. So for example, I was a volunteer in a nonprofit organization doing some work that I felt was really, really important and work that I believed in. But this particular nonprofit organization had a lot of drama. <laughs> And it just became a time suck and an emotional drain. And I just said, you know, I'm really sorry. I'm going to resign this position um, because I just can't dedicate this kind of energy to the position. And that, that took guts um, to do because nobody likes to be considered a quitter. But sometimes as a leader, you do just have to say no to protect yourself. And then finally, say help. <laughs> Um, lots of leaders have a tendency to do everything themselves and while that can be admirable what ends up happening is you get overwhelmed and then un become unable to do anything um, as well as you would like to so I think that saying help yeah, there's people here in the audience in the studio kind of laughing at each other most of them are professors um, so you know you need to say help in terms of asking for assistance delegating um, but sometimes it's also help, like just mentoring. Like I had lunch with Lillian and said, you know, like tell me a little bit about how you became a university administrator and how was that experience for you and how did you get there? And that was a, I was really kind of asking for mentoring. Um, and I think that's, that's okay to do. People need to do that. So that's the your voice part. Um, now let's talk about leadership voice. So leadership voice. I like to think of this as what to say, the advanced stuff. Okay, so here's the advanced stuff that you say as a leader. Um, and those things are stop, why, and how. So sometimes as a leader, you really just have to stand up when things are not going right. You have to stand up when people are being treated unjustly or when principles that you believe in are being violated. Um, that's really hard to do. But sometimes you just have to do it because that's how you live with yourself at the end of the day, being true to yourself and being true to your principles. So sometimes as a leader, um, you just have to say stop. I think Winston Churchill said that if nobody hates you by the time you die, it's because you never stood up for anything. And when I feel like a lot of people hate me, that's what I try to tell myself because it's really <laughs> reassuring. Okay, so in addition to saying stop, um, here's advanced leadership, um, it's also good to say why. It's amazing to me how some situations continue just because things have always been a certain way. And the reason that they've always been a certain way is because nobody said stop, and also because nobody really sat down and said why. Why is it like this? Why are, why are classes scheduled at 8 a.m.? You know, and I have this question um, all the time with the school board in San Diego. Why do high schools start class at 7.30? You know, research shows that teenage brains don't wake up until 11 a.m. and then they're nocturnal, like it's, it's actually a biophysical thing. So why do high schools start at 7.30? I mean, I think this is a valid question, um, which the school board doesn't like to hear asked, but you know, I really wanna know why, why is that? And the answer is because of football. But anyway, <laughs> um, the, third, the third thing to say um, when you're talking about your leadership voice is how. Ask yourself how you can make things better for yourself, 
for your family, for your community, for your country. Um, maybe it's, you know, by joining the military, you help our country. Maybe by volunteering at a school, you help your community. Maybe by getting a college degree, you help your family. Um, maybe by going to bed three hours early for three nights in a row, you help yourself. You know, sometimes you really have to ask how can things be made better um, and then be creative in answering that question. So that's my three points related to your leadership voice, which leaves us with the last word in the title of this presentation, um, which is finding. And I have to say that if you can work through all the pieces of your leadership voice, if you can work through those three pieces, then you really don't have to worry about the finding part. Because each of us and every single one of you watching the webinar, each of us already has a leadership voice. We just need to acknowledge that voice and to use that voice. So let me go back for a minute to the idea of identities being avowed and ascribed. Sometimes we don't always feel like we're leaders, right? We don't always avow a leader identity. But what we don't realize is that even in those situations when we don't avow a leader identity for ourselves, there could be someone out there ascribing a leader identity to us. So somebody out there sees you as a leader. Um, you know, by finishing high school, by being an FIU student, just by taking the time to, uh, to, to be part of this webinar today, you are being a leader and someone out there sees you as a leader. It could be a family member, a younger brother or sister, it could be a friend, it could be a professor. Um, someone in your life is ascribing to you a leader identity. And I would just encourage you to embrace that leader identity and avow that identity for yourself. Then be an authentic leader, someone whose thoughts and actions and words are all aligned. And then use your leadership voice now that you know that you don't have to find it. You just have to acknowledge that your leadership voice is there and use it. So with that, I guess we'll open it up to questions. Great. Thank you. Those are a lot of inspiring things. So while we um, let questions um, come, come from online, I want to follow up on something that, that you said and, kind of, and link, um, link it a little bit to previous themes that we've had at the webinar, which is about um, kind of in a concrete way in careers, how does one choose to accept and find and, and uh, excel in leadership positions? Right. So can you tell us a little bit about um, kind of your maybe some specific leadership uh, opportunities or positions that you've had and, and uh, kind of why you've chosen them? Because I particularly find that interesting in the context of the multiple identities, because, uh, you know, you're a parent and you're a community advocate and there's many things that you do. When do you choose to take leadership? in, you know, official yeah. leadership in yeah. things versus just participate or yeah. follow? Yeah, that's a really good question, especially for someone who still sometimes struggle with the saying no part of leadership because we all want to do, you know, what we want to do to help our community. I think when I'm making a choice about what leadership roles to take and what leadership roles to not take, um, it's about, on the one hand, giving back. It's also about making a difference. So I try to choose the roles where I know that I bring something unique to that position and that it's my doing it that will help a situation be better. Um, and sometimes I'm the best person for that job at that time and sometimes I'm not. And when I'm not the best person for a job at a particular time, I think it's perfectly fine to say, you know what, give this opportunity to somebody else. What about, you know, another recurring theme is, you know, this is the, the, the Copenhagen Center for the Advancement of Women in Communication. So we often talk about the distinct distinction, if any, between being a woman leader and a man leader. And, uh, and in academia, I would say it's still a male-dominated um, environment. 
And um, how would you say gender plays a role in your leadership, if at all? Well, I think that's a really good question because it does get back to this issue of identity being ascribed and identity being avowed, right? So I think that the problem lies in both of those areas. On the one hand, you see sometimes women who um, are hesitant to avow an identity as a leader. You know, they'll be like, I'll step up and do it if no one else will. Like, you know, so sometimes women just don't want to stand up and be like, I'll do it, I want to be a leader. So that's a challenge on the avowal side of the spectrum. On the other hand, with the ascribed side um, of identity, you do sometimes run into situations where there are people who don't think women can be leaders, right? So they see you as a female and they automatically ascribe to you a non-leader identity. So I think it's a challenge to just kind of balance those two things, um, to be very careful not to let the identity ascriptions of other people define who you are, but also being willing in the right situations to proactively step up and avow a leader identity. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. Does anyone have any questions from the studio yet? I mean, Monica's typing up the questions from the web, so I will. I have another question <laughs> about what um, when you spoke about having distinct identities. I think um, you know most of our students are bicultural and uh, you know often bilingual or have more than one culture. Mm -hmm. And as we teach in our you know, cultural communication classes. Culture is not only about race, ethnicity, and country of origin, right? It's the things that you like to do and, and how you see yourself and things like that. And, um, you know, that, that, that's a very interesting thing to play out in the workplace, <laughs> right? And uh, because you, you have your ethnic identities, but your leadership identity, your identity as a teacher, as a researcher, right? As a professional, different things like that. How do you... Um, you know, with the, with the experience that you've acquired with this switching identities as needed, how do, how do you explain that or, or teach that to students? What can, what can we yeah. share with students about that? Okay, well, here's, I think, a couple points. The first point that I would make is that um, we're not schizophrenics, right? We, we are always... Well, we might be. <laughs> well, we're not clinically schizophrenic. Um, we are all, always, simultaneously all of those identities at once, right? I mean, you can't, I can't walk into a room and pretend I'm not a mom. Um, and much to my children's chagrin, I can't walk into a room at their school and pretend I'm not a college professor. Like I do edit their teachers' take home papers sometimes. Um, you know, like that's just who I am. And I think it's okay to be authentic and say, these are all of the identities that I am, that I avow, that I embrace. Um, you know, this is, this is me, this is all of me. I think that where people run into challenges is where they try to only show one side of themselves in a particular situation. And that, besides being emotionally exhausting, I think that's problematic because you're not being authentic and you're not being true to your whole self. Um, which brings me to the second point, which is a point about work-life fit. Right. So back in the day, people talked about work-life balance, and then they quickly realized that was a stupid term because balance doesn't exist, and nobody can balance, and plus, it sounds like you're weighing one thing against another thing. So if you look at the organizational psychology literature today, the, the term that's in use right now is work-life fit. And work-life fit means two things. It means how work and life fit together for you personally. Work-life fit is also about how the way you put work and life together, how that fits with the way your employer wants you to put work and life together. So if you're somebody who has a family, don't go work for an employer that's not gonna give you family leave or give you permission to leave early to go to a school event or take your kids to the doctor. You know, it's about fitting your values and your priorities to the values and priorities of your employer. And when you find that fit, um, I think that makes the multiplicity of identities and handling that multiplicity, it makes that part so much easier. Yeah, I have a question about the authentic voice. Uh, do you find, and again I'll go back to the gender division, do you find that in the professional world, and even in academia, uh, that women tend to uh, kind of 
uh, inhibit their authentic voice at some point compared to men, men. And I often see that male have no problems to really express any authentic voice while women, if there will be a conflict at one point, might prefer to uh, just not express their opinions or thoughts and or, or, or confront conform to the, you know, to the consensus. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's... I'm, I'm going to yeah. restate the question so that the folks online can hear okay. it. Um, it. Is there a difference in the way men and women assert their authentic voice in the workplace and in academia, particularly when there's conflicts or things like that? And is it, you know, why is it, or is it true that, that women sometimes don't do that? Um, I think the short answer is yes. <laughs> Um, and I don't know if there are tons of questions I could just stop there, but um, but I'll, but I think the longer answer is very very complicated, right? So women, from what I've observed, and you know I'm only one person observing a limited part of the world, but from what I've seen, women tend to self-censor their voice, right? You know we think something, and we don't say it. Um, Sometimes we don't say it because we're not comfortable saying it, or we've been taught that nice girls don't use words like that, um, or we we are concerned that we don't want people to think you know we're evil witches. Um, but the challenge is that there is a disparity in people's perceptions based on gender of the speaker, right? So. A guy could say something and people would be like, yeah, how forceful. You know, and a woman could say the same thing and people would be like, wow, what a bitch, right? Um, so I think it's a case-by-case -case situation where you have to figure out how comfortable you are speaking up in a particular situation um, and also how the other people in that situation might interpret your words. Um, for myself, personally, I found that every single time I don't use my authentic voice and every single time I don't say what I really think, I've regretted it. Um, and I just don't do that anymore because life is too short for regrets. Um, so you just say it, you just say it. And you don't have to say it in a mean way, you know? Like, you, I can say very nicely, wow, this is the most silly piece of bureaucratic red tape paperwork I've ever encountered. Um, you know, so you can say it nicely, but it still gets the point across. I think the, the challenge is to um, find that voice and use it. So a, re a related question that came from one of the, um, the participants online, um, I'm paraphrasing, but um, something along the lines of, I'm not a wallflower. In other words, I um, don't keep quiet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and, I, and so often, my, when I use my voice, it's interpreted as aggressiveness, mm -hmm. right? So the question was, how can I use my um, authentic voice without being perceived as aggressive? Well, I think you sometimes you say things nicely, um, <laughs> but also sometimes it's a trade-off, and you have to become a good judge of other people, and you have to become a good judge of the situation. Because sometimes, sometimes there are certain situations where you have to be aggressive to get your point across, um, and there is just no other way to do it. So you have to decide what the trade-offs are for you and whether you're willing to live with that. Yes, we'll take a question in the Who's studio. Recommendations for helping students to find their identity and about who they really are. Well, do you want to repeat the question for them? Does she have recommendations uh, to help students find their identity and avow who they really are? I think for college students, it's really hard because college students are, you know, and all studies show this, college students are at a point where their identity is in flux. Right? So they're coming from a home identity, they're trying to discover a grown-up identity, um, and I would say that that's okay. And recognizing sometimes that the college years are a period of identity flux is okay. Um, my suggestions for kind of um, living during these years would be to not give up on the identity that you came from and to be very thoughtful about the identity that you're developing. Because what we see sometimes is people get to college and there's a wholesale renunciation of where they come from. I don't think that's always healthy. You might be able to get away with that for a decade or so, but eventually you, go, you, you miss your roots. You know? So I would say to college students, don't, don't give up on the identity that you came from. 
sometimes we also see college students who, whether they give up their old identities or not, take on identities that are really not socially healthy. You know, they're doing certain behaviors or, or what have you. Um, and I would say to students, you really need to be intentional and thoughtful and careful as you try on new identities. Because even as you are kind of trying out avowals of different identities, there are people around you ascribing identities to you. So you don't know, but that one semester you've decided to avow this kind of risky, devil may care, I'm not gonna, not gonna care about school identity. Um, and you might think you're just kind of experimenting and figuring out who you are. But for all you know, that semester, you're in a class with a professor who's going to become a really important professional contact with you. And because you were avowing a negative identity in class that semester, that's how that professor is going to ascribe your identity for years to come. So, you know, I think definitely just recognizing that the college years are a period where identity is in flux, um, and that's perfectly normal and it's okay. But my two suggestions would be don't give up on the identity that you come from and be really thoughtful about the different identities you're trying out. So another question that came from one of the online participants was about um, leadership education. And um, you know, in most PR programs, there is no, not a specific class on leadership. Do you think that that would be a good addition to the curriculum? Or, you know, how do you see incorporating leadership into the mm -hmm. PR curriculum? You know what, I don't even think it's just about the PR curriculum. Yeah, the, the I think all college students should have some kind of leadership class, right? I don't know if, if Florida International has this, but at some universities they, they have kind of a freshman seminar mm -hmm. to get students geared up for college. And I think the freshman seminar is a great opportunity to initiate conversations about leadership. Sometimes what happens is as professors, we live in the academy and we think everybody walks around with PhDs. Well, the reality is in our country, only about 28% of people even have college degrees, right? I know, as, for, as professors, we forget that. Um, so if somebody is in a college class, they are gonna become a leader. So it, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that leadership education for all college students is really, really important. And unfortunately, when you look at the so-called leaders of our country right now, um, you see kind of just how important true leadership education really is. Because I would like to think that if some of our political so-called leaders had had some leadership training, our country wouldn't be um, facing quite the same challenges that it's facing today. A question from the I wanted to ask, like, for any leader, how important is uh, charisma of being charismatic as a leader? The question is, how important is it to be charismatic to be a leader? There's actually been studies on this, um, and unfortunately or fortunately, it turns out that charisma is really important. This is why you end up with people who commit mass suicide because they followed some religious guru leader, right? Because they were so charismatic, they talked people into it. Um, so I hate to have to say that, but charisma in the modern age is important um, because of the media environment that we live in, because of people's very short attention spans. I personally don't think that we live in a world anymore where you can be an effective leader without charisma. You can still be a good leader and you can still have good leadership skills and do good leadership work. You're just not going to have as many followers because that's just the nature of the world we live in. And I hate to have to say that, but that's how I feel. Authentic voice. <laughs> so, to follow up on that. Um, since you say that like anybody can be a leader, that leadership is innate, it's just about finding it, is being charismatic innate? I think being charismatic is learned. Yeah, I think being charismatic is learned. I think you can learn how to be outgoing. I think you can learn how to network. I think you can learn how to talk to people. Um, there are ways that you can cultivate that. Even for the most introverted person, I think you can learn how to be professionally outgoing. Mm -hmm. Did you read anything? Because I've read that people who are very tall, six feet and over, and tall women, 
command a certain presence that others ascribe leadership to them. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh um, there's, are there studies that show that people who are tall, men over six feet and women who are tall, um, others abs ascribe leadership to them because of their tall? Yeah, apparently that's what the studies show. Um, but then there's also plenty of short people who have been perfectly fine leaders, you know, like Napoleon comes to mind. So <laughs> I don't necessarily think as somebody who's five one and a half, and the half is very important. Um, <laughs> I don't. I would like to think that being short doesn't automatically disqualify me from the leadership ranks. It's not a question of disqualification. It's a question that others immediately assume you're a leader because you're yeah. not. And I've read studies that you make an automatic assumption, and that if you're shorter, you need to more you need to command more attention to gain that uh, title of Right, well, right, and that's why one of the reasons why I started my talk with this idea of identity being avowed and ascribed, right? So the two things do have to go hand in hand. You can avow a leadership identity until the cows come home, but if other people don't ascribe that identity exactly. to you, um, then you're kind of, you know, in the, stuck in a hard place. Yeah? yeah? Okay. This might be obvious or redundant, but how do you define a leader? What mm. is your definition? That question was one a question online as well. What are some of the qualities um, besides the ones already said, like charisma and uh, and voice? What qual what would you say are the qualities of a leader? Well, what are the qualities of a leader? I think is different a little bit different from definition of a leader. So okay. let me let me start there. I think my personal definition of a leader is somebody who stands up for what they believe in, somebody who stands up for what they know to be right and somebody who can convince others to work together toward a common goal in support of what they believe to be right. Um, that's my personal personal definition. Um, and the qualities for that, you know, besides the, one, the ones that we've talked about, um, I think consensus building is very, very important because we live in a diverse world. So if you're going to truly be a leader, you have to know how to get people to work together um, toward the same goal, and that's sometimes very hard to do. So I think leadership is also um, having the skills to be able to bring diverse groups of people to consensus. You, you just mentioned something that um, you know, made me think. Sometimes when you work in a, in a big institution or you know, in the government, I imagine, and things like that, there's things going on that you don't like, right? And then that aren't the way you wish they could be. And you just said that part of a definition of a leader is someone that, you know, uses their their leadership to work towards something that they believe is right. But um, sometimes leaders find themselves in situations where they don't think it's right. Um, what what do you think about leaders that find themselves in kind of conflicts? about what maybe an institution wants them to do as a leader and what they think is right? Oh, well, in that case, um, you have to make a decision about which thing you value more, I guess, your job or your personal integrity. Um, in an ideal world, you would go with personal integrity, and especially in public relations, we see this a lot, right, where organizations are trying to hide something they did that maybe wasn't so cool, and the PR person's like, Ugh, conscience of the organization, I've got to speak up, I've got to say something, and they find themselves out of a job. Um, I would say this, you can always find another job, but if you lose yourself, you can't always find another self. Hmm. We have a lot of discussions about that in class with ethics, you know, and, and I think I've found, I don't know if you've found the same, that, you know, students seem to be a little cynical about that, about, um, you know, there be you being able to find an, the next job if you stand up for what's right. They think, you know, I think the the prevailing sense is that you'll be either labeled as a troublemaker or there really aren't that, you know, you won't have a good recommendation when you leave, and especially younger folks, right? I mean, um, that aren't quite at the leadership position yet. But that balance between integrity in a job is a complicated one. Right? I think there's always, always, always going to be organizations that want to employ people with integrity. Yeah. So, and you know what? We live in an entrepreneurial society. Why wait to find a job? Why not create your own? Okay. Yeah. Any? That's another great topic. Yes.
So uh, someone had a follow-up question on the height, okay. <laughs> right? And I, and I, I guess... Um, Am I really five, one and a half? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I guess this applies not only to height, but um, to other maybe characteristics that are visually not, um, you know, uh, ascribed mm -hmm. as going with leadership. But so if someone who's very short and others don't look at me as a leader, um, you know, how do, do I have to work extra hard and, and how? What do I need to do? Well, again, the short answer is probably yes. You do have to work extra hard. Um, but, you know, it has to start somewhere, right? I mean, until Barack Obama, people said the White House was the White House, right? It has to start from somewhere. Why not with you? Okay. Well, well, we'll hang on a few minutes to see if any more questions come in from online. Um, I'm, I'm particular. Uh, you know, I want to follow up on what you said about um, the voice and asking for help. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, how and, and and this is kind of tying it back to some of the of, of the recurring themes in this uh, webinar series, and it's about mentorship. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's been established that something that we, that absolutely is going to help people in their careers and you know become mm -hmm. the best self they can be and everything is to identify mentors and um, and have someone to go for help for advice um, what do you what would you say to students um, and for young professionals about finding mentors and interacting with mentors and mm -hmm. and uh, maybe holding on <laughs> to mentors okay well I would say um, first that your question, finding mentors, plural, is very important. I think we need to get away from the idea that there's one person out there who has everything that we need, who has every answer to every question that we could possibly have. So I think that definitely we need more than just one mentor. We need a team of mentors. So you might have somebody that you go to related to school. You might have somebody that you go to related to um, the kind of job that you want. You might have somebody else that you go to about family challenges. So definitely think of it as a mentoring team, a support group to help you um, achieve your goals. Um, in terms of finding the mentors and then keeping them, I would say this. Um, mentoring is something that people do because they want to help out. But mentors are human, right? And sometimes, as somebody who's asking for mentorship, we have to be careful to not always, always only be asking, right? Even if we're the ones who are receiving mentorship, we can give to our mentor. Um, we can give to our mentor in terms of appreciation. We can give to our mentor maybe in um, something that we have to offer that is you know, new or different for our mentor. Like the first thing that comes to mind for young people is technology. social media, <laughs> technology. You know, like I need a mentor in technology. Mm -hmm. um, I'd happily do career mentoring in exchange for somebody to help me set up my phone. Um, real <laughs> offer. Um, so, you know, I think the, the person being mentored shouldn't always feel like they're on the receiving end. You can also do some giving. So mentoring is definitely a two-way street, and that's the best way to keep a mentor. So we have a couple more questions um, from the participants online, and one of them is, how do you ask for help without losing control of the task? I guess without, I, I, what I understand from this question is without seeming that you're incapable. Oh, well, wow, these are really good questions. Um, I think it's about how you ask for it. Um, and it's also about the magnitude or the degree of the help that you need. So, um, so for example, in my, my current job, I have to put together a huge report. <laughs> It's like this big. And so I went to the faculty and said, you know what, I need help. So here are the seven section, nine sections of the report. Can everybody sign up to coordinate the information gathering for a particular section? And you know what? We went through each section, one through nine, and some sections had no volunteers. And I'm like, OK, I guess I'll volunteer for that one. And then other sections had volunteers. And I said, thank you so much. I'll assign you that section. Um, I don't think people think 
that I'm incapable of putting together the whole report for myself. I think it's, um, you know, we're in this together. We're working collectively toward a common goal, which is what this report is for. And people want to participate in the process. So I don't think it's necessarily um, a perception necessarily that people would feel you're incompetent just because you're asking for help. Um, so maybe I. No, no. I think I think that's a, a very um, valid answer. I think I'm I'm going back to again another theme that that comes that's come up a lot in these webinars, and it's the to to have the courage to do things you've never done before mm -hmm. is part of being a leader, right? And yeah. to take on tasks that you might not be 100% comfortable mm -hmm. doing. So I, I imagine it's more along those lines. Something that perhaps. You're, you're not 100% doing, but you, we want it to be yours, right? Yeah, and I think that's okay. I think you can say, you know what, this is the first time that I've ever done this. I'm not really sure if I'm on the right track. Do you mind looking this over and just making sure that I'm going in the right direction? Um, I think that's perfectly okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, a, one of the questions that came from the participants online, they're giving an example of a young woman who's, who's a, a student and a leader among her peers, and she's a, um, an athlete and captain of her team, but yet um, is afraid to, to be assertive and assert that leadership with the coaches who are all older men. Mm -hmm. What would you say? And you know, of course, there's many layers to that and many of the things we've talked about here. What, what would you say to someone like that? Um, I think it depends on the situation and what it is that she's trying to be assertive about, right? So, you know, say it's the team really wants to have practice at a different time. I mean, I don't know, so I'm just making this up. Say the team wants to have practice at a different time. Well, maybe, you know, she could go to the team, take a vote, and then report that to the coaches so that it's not just her, I want a different time. It's her saying, I've talked to my peers, we've talked about the pros and the cons of the current practice time, and as a team, we really feel that we would benefit from moving the practice time to this other hour. Um, and just presenting the results where it's a little less scary because you're not just out there by yourself, but you have kind of the weight of the team behind you. So I think that's one mm -hmm. um, one way to do it. I mean, and I think part of what you're saying is the, the importance of evidence and data, right? right. To, to kind of make uh, arguments stronger right. and that, that helps when you're trying to exert leadership. Right. Well, and also I think in the situation of, of young women leaders who have to work with older male leaders, um, sometimes it's finding what resonates with them. You know, like maybe they don't want you to like boss them around, but maybe you go to them and say, you know, look, I need some help, I need some advice, and here's the challenge that I'm facing. And then, you know, you let them give you an answer that was really the answer that you were gonna give them, but you let them come <laughs> up with it so they think it's their answer. Um, sometimes that works really well. So going back to something that you, you said about ascribed leadership, sometimes people might not consider themselves leaders, but they're seen mm -hmm. as leaders by others. Talk a little bit about the, the difference between leaders with titles and, um, and, you know, and how important is it to get you know, to the positions where you're recognized as a leader kind of by an institution. Oh, I think that varies for people. I think some people are perfectly happy being leaders in fact without any fancy titles. And um, unfortunately, there are also people out there who really like the fancy titles even though they offer no leadership to go with it. So I really think that's a personal preference. I'm not sure what the question yes, yes, is, that, but it's, you know. Okay, so, well, but is it important for for women who want to be leaders to get to those positions with titles? Okay, so I will say this. If you are somebody who um, plans to be a leader in your career field, then yes, the titles are important. However, so is doing the actual work of a leader. Because at some point, people are gonna look at your titles and start asking around and ask, what did you do in fact as a leader while you held this leadership title? And again, if your actions aren't really matching the words on your business card, then you just don't advance anymore. Yeah, because we've all met people we're not sure how they <laughs> got those titles on their business cards. And yeah, the world is full of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's about 400 or so sitting in Washington right now. <laughs> yes. Not that I feel strongly about our current political moral impasse, but whatever. <laughs> 
Well, um, if no one has any, oh, there is another question what, before we man, wrap up. As a man, <laughs> and I'm speaking about myself, but what should, how should stubborn men better um, uh, understand female leaders? Like if there's a female leader and you're a stubborn man who's like, I, I can't accept this. Well, how should they learn to better accept a female leader? Um. You want to repeat the question so people online know? Yeah, so there's, there's stubborn males that um, don't, I guess, don't acknowledge the leadership mm -hmm. of, of females and what can be done, I guess, to influence, to, to help them learn to acknowledge female leaders? I think that's a question. First, you have to kind of do some analysis, right? I think um, sometimes there's an assumption that people are against a woman leader because she's a woman. But that's an assumption. Sometimes people might be against a woman leader because she's not a good leader, um, you know, or she's doing something not appropriate for the institution or whatever. So I think that we have to be really careful about, about making assumptions about when we have multiple identities, which identities are relevant in a particular time. Sometimes gender is completely irrelevant. And so I would say, Related to this whole conversation, you know, something that we were talking about at lunch is we do talk a lot about women in leadership because there's so few women leaders. But at the end of the day, it's also just about leadership, right? So it doesn't, leadership and the conversations about leadership don't always have to be gendered, right? So we follow good leaders, we follow effective leaders, and I think that what we can all do as men and as women is to follow good leaders and good effective leaders with, without regard to their gender. Well, and I, I'm going to kind of follow up on that a little bit and ask you, what about, you know, as someone who's from an ethnic minority, I'm Hispanic, um, you know, it means a lot to me when I see Hispanic leaders that are good. There's also a lot out there that are not that good. But, but um, you know, it, it, it helps, um, you know, in terms of identity and all of that, it means a lot to have... Um, Every, you know, people that rep represented in the leadership. Mm -hmm. So to what extent is that something that should be considered, you know, a, kind of representing a group or something like that when you're trying to be a leader? Yeah, and I think that gets really tricky too because sometimes there's an assumption when you're a member of a minority group, there's an assumption that you're a leader but only for that group, right? And I think that um, it's a very tricky balancing act because as a minority leader, um, on the one hand, it's great to be a trailblazer and to have other people um, recognize that you're doing something that makes a difference in your ethnic community. But, you know, the challenge is that if we're going to say that ethnic minorities can only be leaders in those minority communities, that's like saying women leaders can only be leaders of women. Mm -hmm. And that's not effective, right? Because again, being a leader is about bringing diverse groups of people together. Um, so I think the trick for women leaders or for minority leaders is somehow being true to that part of our identity while also being able to go beyond that and provide leadership for everyone, regardless of their background. Mm -hmm. So we have a great question from online that can help to wrap up uh, our, because it brings together several themes res with respect to identity and I avowed identity. So sometimes we don't see ourselves as leaders despite having several leadership roles. Mm -hmm. So how can we change this perception about ourselves and our own identity? That's a really good question. Um, and I would say this is one of those times where you have to use your leadership voice and ask why. Why, despite having held leadership titles and leadership roles, why do you not see yourself as a leader? Um, and you know, I'm not necessarily clinically qualified to help answer that question. Um, sometimes it's as simple as just embracing it and saying, okay, I'm a leader. Um, sometimes, you know, it might take a little bit more digging, talking to a mentor, talking to a counselor. Um, but if you're in a position where you're holding a leadership title and where other people are already seeing you as a leader, then you owe it to those people who follow you and you owe it to yourself to answer the question of why you can't avow a leadership identity. And once you answer that question and have a solution to your challenge, um, then you can go ahead and avow that identity because I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. 
Well, with that, I think we'll close. We're on time to close at 2 p.m. So thank you so much for your your insights. I think uh, this, there a lot of important things were said. I made a lot of notes that I'm sure we'll, we'll take back with us. So join me in thanking thank Dr. You. Thank you. David Shaw. And uh, this webinar will be available online at copenhavercenter.org.